So I met my wife in 2009. We were working together. And during our dating phase, we had kind of a ritual at the end of the workday. She lived out in the country and uh, on Oak Hill Road near Sutherland. And we'd go walking in the evening uh, out the road, just talking and enjoying company. And one night in particular, it's very dark. It's the middle of winter. It's cloudy outside. It's foggy. It's hard to see. And her dogs are with us. And I just don't do animals. I don't get it. Like, I don't get the appeal. I'm sorry if you're an animal lover. God loves you too. But I just don't get it, okay? And so we're going on a walk, and I'm trying to engage her dogs so she doesn't think I'm some psychopath who hates animals. And we're on our way back to her house, and her dogs just take off into a field that's near her home. And I'm thinking, okay, they're excited to be home. Awesome. So I'll get some alone time, right? We'll get a one-on-one. Moments later, the two dogs come running back, but there's a third party in their midst. And it's foggy, it's dark, I couldn't see very well. And so I bend down to get a closer look, and I'm thinking, this may be a cat that the dogs are terrorizing. I'm going to show my compassion towards animals before my future bride. And I bend down to look at this thing, and out of the corner of my eye, I see my future wife dart up the hill like an Olympic athlete. She scrambles over a barbed wire fence, and I... I'm looking down at this thing. I see this out of the corner of my eye. And then I hear, that's not a cat. And I look at what's in front of me. And it was a skunk. And I'm feet from this skunk going, here, kitty, kitty, kitty. And she's like, booked it up the hill. I darted towards her house. Both of her dogs got sprayed. I didn't get sprayed, luckily. But my behavior did not match the reality in front of me. Right? If you have a skunk in front of you, you run. Or you get sprayed. Right? I believe we can often do that same thing with Jesus. That though the reality of who he is may be right in front of us, maybe we're in scripture and we're in good Christian community and we're in relational prayer with him. You see, we can have all of the right words and all of the wrong beliefs. Does your behavior match the reality of who Jesus claims himself to be? If Jesus says, I am Lord, do you live a life of surrender to the Lord? If Jesus says, I am forgiving, when you mess up, do you run to him or do you run from him? If Jesus is the light of the world, are you living in light? If Jesus is the bread of life and living water, are you coming to him for nourishment and sustenance? You see, I think often there's a disconnect between who Jesus claims himself to be and how his people live. And so today, we're going to continue our series, I Am. And my hope for you and I today is that we would align what we believe about Jesus with who he claims to be. Not who my twisted view of him is or who somebody else told me he is, but who is Jesus. And we're going to be looking at a passage in John 10. You can turn there in your Bibles. John 10 And Jesus is going to make the claim that he is a good shepherd, which means for you and I, we're sheep. And sheep are not the wisest of animals. Let me demonstrate. Sheep gets pulled out of the ditch. I'm free. No, I'm not. Okay. So so this sheep gets saved by the shepherd and then goes right back in the same ditch that he fell into in the first place. Right? Is that not a picture often of us? Right? God pulls us out. And maybe you're here today and you think, man, I just keep falling in the same ditch. I hope that as we examine what it means that Jesus is the good shepherd, it compels our hearts to turn to him no matter what ditch we may be in. We all need the good shepherd. He's not just the good shepherd. He is a necessary shepherd. Right, And we're going to be in chapter 10. Now, last week, Paul went over chapter 9. And he kind of told the story of a man who was born blind. And Jesus heals him. There's this amazing thing. He's dancing around. He's super excited. And the Pharisees are not happy about this. Because this happens on the Sabbath. So they ask him, who did it? Who healed you? And he's like, you guys remember the story, right? I, I couldn't see him. Right? But ultimately, Jesus reveals himself. And they're not happy about it. They thought they were doing the right thing. They thought, we're defending the Sabbath. We're holding up the law. We're upholding the regulations. 
all the while they were missing the one who was the fulfillment of it all. That's the backdrop of this conversation that Jesus is about to have. John 10, starting in verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you. Now, anytime Jesus says truly, truly, it's like, listen up. Okay, this is important. You'll notice throughout the book of John, when Jesus makes an I am statement, there's often truly, truly right before it. So he says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. You see, in, in ancient Israel, there were two kinds of shepherds. Politicians and spiritual leaders were often considered spiritual shepherds of the people. And he said, there is a way that they have gained access to the sheepfold that is not the door. It's, it's not entering the way that God had planned. It's not the call of God. You see, often these leaders entered in by political ambition or influence and connection in, the, in the society. And so they found themselves shepherding the people of God, but they weren't very good shepherds. And they had climbed in another way by political ambition and connection. And Jesus places himself in contrast with that. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. We're going to see Jesus throughout this passage continually placing himself in contrast to the religious leaders of the day. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This is, Jesus is saying, this shepherd, the shepherd that I am the good shepherd, he intimately knows his sheep. He knows them by name. You see, the Pharisees looked at the sheep and, and, and they, they looked at them with judgment and condemnation. Jesus is this tender care and love, provision and protection. The, sh- the true shepherd, the good shepherd, knows his sheep by name. They follow him. They know his voice. There's authentic relationship there. And he goes on. It says, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying. This happens so much in the Gospels. It's adventures and missing the point, right? They just lost it. They didn't know what he was talking about. Jesus is contrasting himself to them. Right? They just saw a man who was one of their sheep get healed of a lifelong illness. And their response is judgment. And Jesus is saying, that's not, what, that's not what the response of a shepherd should be. If you care for your sheep and they're healed, you should be rejoicing with them. So he goes on to continue to explain in their confusion. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, again, listen up. I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. When he says, I am the door of the sheep, ancient shepherds, it wasn't a nine to five job. This is a lifestyle. You live with your sheep. You are constantly there to protect them. In fact, shepherds were known to sleep at the gate or the gap or the door of the sheep pen to protect the sheep, to keep them safe, that they might be present when predators come. He's contrasting. He says, I am that shepherd who lays at the door to be with the sheep. I'm going to protect them. I'm going to provide for them. I'm caring for them. I am present with them. All who came before me, though, were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. The Pharisees are sitting there listening to this, and he's calling them out. You're not here to care for the sheep. You're not here to to provide and protect. You're here to take. You're a thief. He goes on. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. He says, here's another contrast. You shepherds, the Pharisees, you've come to only take. You're, you're plundering these people for your own selfish ambition. What does the good shepherd do? What does Jesus as the door of the sheep do? He's not about selfish ambition. He's about self-sacrifice. He's laying his life down. 
I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Pharisees are taking from the people. Jesus is saying, I want to give you life. More than that, I want to give you abundant life. He goes on, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I want to go back to this one real quick. I am the good shepherd. Now, to an uh, uh, ancient uh, Pharisee, this culture, they, they viewed shepherds as extremely low on the social totem pole, okay? So to say a good shepherd is a contradiction in terms. It's like an oxymoron. Like a shepherd is considered unclean, defiled, and lowly. And the word that Jesus uses here for good, it, it connotes like beauty and awesomeness and nobleness in contrast to that which is foul and wicked. Again, Jesus is making a distinction between himself and the Pharisees. And he uses this term that would have been confusing. What do you mean a good shepherd? The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus is laying out that he's going to lay down his life for the sheep. The people that were hearing this had no context. The cross hadn't happened yet. They didn't know what he was talking about. But often in ancient Israel, shepherds were prone to find themselves in areas of danger. Uh, King David, who was a shepherd before he was a king, said that he fought bears and lions and the wolves were enemies of the sheep. And so a shepherd's job was to provide and protect for the sheep. And he says, a hired hand doesn't care for the sheep. He looks at the sheep and he sees a dollar sign. And when the predator comes, when the wolf comes, he's out of here. This is just a summer job to him. He doesn't care. In contrast to the good shepherd who cares deeply about his sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. The good shepherd desires authentic, intimate relationship. He says, just like he and the Father are connected, that's the kind of relationship he wants with his sheep. And he lays down his life for his sheep. He goes on, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock one shepherd, for this reason, the father loves me. So he's saying, he's speaking mostly to a Jewish audience. And as he's sharing, he's saying, look, I've got sheep among this flock. I'm going to bring them in. They're going to come under the care and protection of the good shepherd. But I've got sheep elsewhere. You know who he's speaking about? Anybody who has not traced their heritage back to ancient Israel. He's talking about you and I. He's talking about the Gentiles having access to the forgiveness, love, and care of the good shepherd. He's he's talking about you and I having relationship with the Father. This is one of those pictures of Jesus saying, the gospel's bigger. I believe the gospel of God has always been bigger than the people of God believed it to be. And as he says this to Pharisees who thought Gentiles like you and I were unclean and hopeless, That would have been a stark reality for them to process. What? But we're the chosen people. What are you? Other sheep. But he says, I'm going to have sheep of all tribes, tongues, and nations. There'll be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the father loves me because I laid down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. Jesus wants it to be very clear. When he dies, he does not die at the hand of the Romans. He does not die at the hand of the Jews. He does not die at the hand of a bloodthirsty crowd. This was his choice. This is the plan. This is intentional. He says, I lay it down. No one takes it from me. This is love. 
And he's sharing this beautiful piece of the gospel that the good shepherd will die for his sheep. And what's the response of the people? This charge I have received from my father. There was again division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. (laughs) Why listen to him? I just think that's so funny. They're wrestling with, wait, Jesus claims to be this, but we've always believed this about God. You know what they're wrestling with? Exactly what you and I are wrestling with in this series. Who is Jesus? Maybe it's different than what I've always thought. Who does he claim to be? And how should I live as a result of that truth? They're wrestling. And some of them say, you know what? He's demon possessed and insane. He's lost that he's off his rocker. But there's another group. Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? They look at what's happening in front of them. They're, they're obviously confused, but they say, a demon can't do the things that Jesus is doing. This can't, we can't just sum it up that he's demon possessed. There's something more happening here. I don't understand, but maybe God is doing something. Anytime the gospel is shared, there will always be division. Why? Because the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved by it, it is the power of God. That's what we see here. There's division. There's those who reject it, and there's those who are saying, I don't know, but it it must be something more. Anytime the gospel is shared, there will always be division. There's a few things I want us to draw out of this about who the good shepherd is. Firstly, the good shepherd knows you. Let's look at it again in the passage. He calls his own sheep by name. He goes on to say, I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father. The good shepherd knows you. This is relational language. He, he deeply knows. He knows your name. He knows how many hairs are on your head. I got a lot of hair. He knows your fears. He knows your worries. He knows your joys. He knows your plans for your future. He knows the, the stuff that haunts you in your past. There's nothing that he does not know about you. You are laid bare before him. And I know that can sound scary. But you know what? This tells us that even though he knows everything, he deeply wants that sort of authentic relationship with his sheep. He wants you. He wants me. He wants to have intimacy in relationship with us. You are known by the good shepherd. Are you living known? You see, the opposite of living known is living hidden. We can know that we're not living known by God and accepted by God when we find ourselves wearing a mask that's not truly who we are. Let me just ask you a question. Where do you find yourself in your world feeling like you have to pretend to be somebody you're not? God did not die that you would have to go on through the rest of your life pretending to be something he did not create you to be. He says, I already know. You don't have to hide. And when we hide from others in our world, and what we're really believing is if they really knew what was going on inside here, they'd reject me. And the belief underneath that is really God knows and he does reject me. But he doesn't. If you are his sheep, if you have truly repented and placed your faith in Jesus, he knows you and he loves you. He knows your mess. He loves you anyways. He factored in your failures and your sin when he chose you to be his child. Jesus dealt with that on the cross. He knows you intimately. Are you living known or are you living hidden? You see, the Pharisees of the day, in contrast to Jesus, Jesus says, I know you and I love you. They say, yeah, I know you and I'm judging you. I'm standing in condemnation over you. The good shepherd knows you. He desires closeness. There was a guy who was helping Billy Graham do Israel tours. And one day they're walking up a hill and a shepherd and his flock were coming down the hill. He wrote a book about this. And there was a a huge flock, but one of the sheep was clearly injured and over the shoulders of the shepherd. And and, uh, the translator stopped and this guy began to interact with him and said, what's wrong with your sheep? And the shepherd said, well, this 
the sheep has a broken leg. And they said, well, what happened? And the shepherd said, well, you see, this sheep is prone to wonder. He's prone to get himself stuck in the brambles and, and in dangerous places where predators are, and he doesn't trust the shepherd. And they're like, okay, but I asked you how the leg was broken, not a rap sheet on your sheep. And he said, I broke it. What? You broke your own sheep's leg? And he said, yes. And now the sheep is learning to trust the shepherd. The shepherd has to hand feed him. The shepherd has to provide for him everything he needs. He's learning to trust. He's learning to become close to the shepherd. Is that not a picture of Jesus? When suffering and difficulty comes into our lives, I believe Jesus is saying, come back to me. I believe Jesus is willing to break a leg to save a life. And whether we're Christian or not, we need saving. If we don't know Jesus, we need salvation. We need the good shepherd to, to rescue us. But even if we're Christian, the gospel is not a moment in history of our life. It's a day to day saying, God, I have no hope but you. I need you to save me. The good shepherd is willing to break a leg that he, leg that he might save your life. So maybe you're going through a period of grief or suffering or difficulty. And I say this with gentleness because I realize this can be a very painful thing. I'm not trying to throw trite phrases on real pain. But the good shepherd wants you to know you can get all that you need from him. He desires this kind of authentic relationship with you, even in the midst of your suffering. I'm afraid far too often, just like that sheep, at least for myself, when it hurts, I'm prone to wander. And see, the cool thing is though, even though the good shepherd knows everything about you, all of your good, your bad, and the ugly, it doesn't change his mind about love. He loves you. Look at this. The good shepherd laid down his life for you. Verse 14 and 15. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. He goes on in 17 and 18. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. What is this? Like Jesus is claiming, I'm a good shepherd. I'm a really good shepherd. And the plan is for the shepherd to die. Like in ancient Israel, you wanted to protect your sheep from dangerous situations, but the plan was always stay alive that you might continue to protect them. But Jesus says, I'm a good shepherd and the plan is to die. Like, can you imagine his LinkedIn profile? Good shepherd, prone to death. Like that just doesn't, what? What does that mean? But he's saying the provision that the sheep need will be found in my death. This is how I'm providing for their protection. This is how I'm going to provide forgiveness, love, relationship with the Father. He's saying this is going to provide everything they need. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus provides everything we need. The good shepherd lays down his life. No one takes it from him. And he gives it up freely. This is the heart of God. God's heart for you is not tepid and distant and cold warm it's close it's authentic love do you believe that if i'm honest with you i'm struggling to believe that because i know my rap sheet i know where i am prone to wander and it's tough for me to believe that and sometimes what happens is we look at god and say well god i'm pretty broken right i I've got sin in my life and I've hurt other people and other people have hurt me. And so we look up at God saying, God, this is a mess. This is a mess. You can't love this. This is, I, I'm a real piece of work here. I've got to figure this out before you could love me. And so what we do is we try and straighten it out and flatten it out and make it nice and pretty and glue it back together again. But no matter the amount of effort we put forth, we can never do what it takes to be accepted by God. His love is free. We don't earn it by ironing our lives out. And we look at God and say, how can you love this mess? And God has a different perspective. You see, we look at God through this lens 
And God looks down from heaven. And he says, I don't see that mess. I see Jesus. I see Jesus. That he who knew no sin became sin for us. That we, you and I, might become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. Jesus has given to us once and for all his righteousness and his goodness. All of the good in his account was credited to you and I when we placed our faith in the cross and the resurrection. When we placed our faith in the finished work of Jesus. And so now we don't have to look up and say, God, you, I don't know how you can love this piece of work. God, thank you that you do love me. Look at this statement. You are fully known and deeply loved. That is so hard for us to believe often because we know our motives. We know our thoughts. We know our actions. We know when we fail. God knows too. He fully knows. He knows us better than we know ourselves and yet still chooses to deeply love you. You are fully known and deeply loved. When I was seven years old, uh, I love Mexican food. My blood is like 95% salsa. And uh, we went to my favorite Mexican restaurant in Medford. And we, uh, we, we, at some point in the meal, realized, okay, my parents are in cahoots with the servers and they are going to sing a song to me and totally embarrass me. And I was mortified at this moment. And sure enough, here comes the trauma train around the corner with a sombrero and a camera, okay? They put the sombrero on me. I turn beet red. They tell everybody in the restaurant to join in singing to me. And everyone's looking at me. and I just want to melt into the chair, right? And then they hand me at the end of it, after taking my picture and putting it on the wall of shame, they hand me a dish of ice cream as though that's some sort of recompense for the trauma I just experienced. And I was so mad at my family that we went outside and I hid in the back of my grandma's Jeep. I refused to get buckled. I put a blanket over me. And then she just said, fine, he's going to have a fit. We'll go. And at some point we're driving and we're going about 40, 45 miles an hour. And I sit up and the back hatch of the Jeep opens up and I somersault out while we're moving and skid across the pavement. And the one thing I remember is my parents jumping out of the Jeep and running to me. Why? Because the one that they loved was in danger and they didn't care what the sacrifice was. They jumped out of a moving vehicle to save me. It's a picture of Jesus. He so loves you that he put himself in mortal peril because you're the one that he loves. And as we've received this this being fully known and deeply loved, it should well up in us gratitude that flows out in mission. You see, the good shepherd knows you, the good shepherd loves you, and the good shepherd didn't stay dead because he rose from the grave three days later, and now he has sent you. Let's look at this passage, Matthew 28. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them. I love that. He comes to his disciples. Some are worshiping like, oh, yes, you're awesome. You're alive. I don't, this is amazing. Others are like, I'm not sure about this. I'm wrestling. What does Jesus do? He doesn't belittle anybody for their doubt. He moves towards them. Jesus came to them. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Here's what this means for us. The good shepherd has sent you. If we've experienced this being fully known and fully loved, awesome, authentic relationship with Jesus, it should well up in us that we want to go and tell others. We can't be content to have the gospel and not share it. You've got to hear about my Jesus. You've got to hear about what he did in my life and what he did for you. He has sent you. He says, Go, make disciples, baptize them, teach them. Go. The good shepherd has sent you. What if the good shepherd has shown you that he knows you and loves you, that you might go out and know and love others towards him? I believe, family church, that through this church, our county will be impacted as we live out the mission of God wherever we go. There are 
if you'll give me the phrase, there are sheep not of this fold in your sphere of influence that God wants to bring in. He's saying, I want you to tell others about my knowing, all-knowing all power and all-loving power. I want you to bring more in. We get to be a part of this mission. And I believe as we follow Jesus, he says, I'm always with you. He's working all around you, no matter where you're at. As we follow him, we're going to see many come into the fold as well. Jesus loves you guys, and so do I. I'm going to release to the campus pastors. All right, thank you guys so much for joining us again today as we continued our series, I Am. And the challenge we want to give is if we are to go out and bring other sheep into the fold, how do we actually do that? And there's a couple tools that we've been looking at for the last several months that we really want to just saturate our lives in. First one is to begin in prayer. That every day when we wake up, begin the day with God, show me where you're at work in my sphere of influence, wherever I am, and show me how to join you in that. I heard it said uh, by Jordan, one of the worship directors here, he says, I always want to be present to the presence of God. When you walk into a room, just shoot up that prayer. God, where are you working here? When you come home, God, where are you working? How can I join you in my family, in my workplace, in my friend circles, wherever I go, to tell everyone else that I know a God who fully knows me and deeply loves me? And the second thing we want to challenge you to is to listen and engage. Listen to other people's stories. I think sometimes, at least for me, I have this, this uh, belief that I need to have all my answers ready and revving. But I think people listen to people who listen. And so be willing to step back and ask more questions and draw out people's hearts. Listen to their story and share the gospel accordingly. Thank you guys so much again for joining us. I love you. Have a great week.